Preface to Hereditary Genius An Inquiry into Its Laws and Consequences by Francis Gowton, Fellowship of the Royal Society This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recorded by Leon Harvey Hereditary Genius An Inquiry into Its Laws and Consequences Prefatory Chapter to the Edition of 1892 this volume is a reprint of a work published twenty-three years ago, which has long been unpurchasable, except at second-hand and at fancy prices. It was a question whether to revise the whole and to bring the information up to date, or simply to reprint it, after remedying a few starting errata. The latter course has been adopted, because even a few additional data would have made it necessary to recast all the tabulations, while a thorough reconstruction would be a work of greater labour than I can now undertake. At the time when the book was written, the human mind was popularly thought to act independently of natural laws, and to be capable of almost any achievement, if compelled to exert itself by a will that had a power of initiation. Even those who had more philosophical habits of thought were far from looking upon the mental faculties of each individual as being limited with as much strictness as those of his body. Still less was the idea of the hereditary transmission of ability clearly apprehended. The earlier part of the book should be read in the light of the imperfect knowledge of the time when it was written, since what was true in the above respects for the year 1896 does not continue to be true for 1892. Many of the lines of inquiry that are suggested or hinted at in this book have since been pursued by myself, and the results have been published in various memoirs. They are for the most part epitomized in three volumes, namely English Men of Science, 1874, Human Faculty, 1883, Natural Inheritance, 1889, also to some small extent in a fourth volume, now about to be published, on finger marks. The fault in the volume that I chiefly regret is the choice of its title of hereditary genius, but it cannot be remedied now. There was not the slightest intention on my part to use the word genius in any technical sense, but merely as expressing an ability that was exceptionally high and at the same time inborn. It was intended to be used in the senses ascribed to the word in Johnson's dictionary, viz. mental power or faculties. Disposition of nature, by which any one is qualified to some peculiar employment. Nature, disposition, a person who is a genius, is denned as a man endowed with superior faculties. This exhausts all that Johnson has to say on the matter, except as regards the imaginary creature of classical authors called a genius, which does not concern us, and which he describes as a protecting or ruling power of men, places, or things. There is nothing in the quotations from standard authors with which Johnson illustrates his definitions that justifies a strained and tentacle sense being given to the word, nor is there anything of the kind in the Latin word ingenium. Hereditary genius, therefore seemed to be a more expressive and just title than hereditary ability, for ability does not exclude the effects of education, which genius does. The reader will find a studious abstinence throughout the work from speaking of genius as a special quality. It is freely used as an equivalent for natural ability in the opening of the chapter on comparison of the two classifications. In the only place, so far as I have noticed on reading the book again, where any distinction is made between them, the uncertainty that still clings to the meaning of the word genius in its technical sense is emphatically dwelt upon. Page 320. There is no confusion of ideas in this respect in the book, but its title seems apt to mislead, and if it could be altered now, it should appear as hereditary ability. The relation between genius in its technical sense whatever its precise definition may be, and insanity, has been much insisted upon by Lombroso and others, whose views of the closeness of the connection between the two are so pronounced, that it would hardly be surprising if one of their more enthusiastic followers were to remark that so-and-so cannot be a genius, because he has never been mad, nor is there a single lunatic in his family. I cannot go nearly so far as they, nor accept a moiety of their data, on which the connection between ability of a very high order and insanity is supposed to be established. Still, there is a large residuum of evidence which points to a painfully close relation between the two, and I must add that my own later observations have tended in the same direction, for I have been surprised at finding how often insanity or idiocy has appeared among the near relatives of exceptionally able men. 
those who are over eager and extremely active in mind must often possess brains that are more excitable and peculiar than is consistent with soundness they are likely to become crazy at times and perhaps to break down altogether their inborn excitability and peculiarity may be expected to appear in some of their relatives also but unaccompanied with an equal dose of preservative qualities whatever they may be those relatives would be crank if not insane there is much that is indefinite in the application of the word genius it is applied to many a youth by his contemporaries but more rarely by biographers who do not always agree among themselves if genius means a sense of inspiration or of rushes of ideas from apparently supernatural sources or of an inordinate and burning desire to accomplish any particular end it is personally near to the voices heard by the insane to the delirious tendencies or to their monomanias it cannot in such cases be a healthy faculty nor can it be desirable to perpetuate it by inheritance the natural ability of which this book mainly treats is such as a modern european possesses in a much greater average share than men of the lower races there is nothing either in the history of domestic animals or in that of evolution to make us doubt that a race of sane men may be formed who shall be as much superior mentally and morally to the modern european as the modern european is to the lowest of the negro races individual departures from this high average level in an upward direction would afford an adequate supply of degree of ability that is exceedingly rare now and is much wanted it may prove helpful to the reader of the volume to insert in this introductory chapter a brief summary of its data and course of arguments the primary objective was to investigate whether and in what degree natural ability was hereditarily transmitted this could not be easily accomplished without a preliminary classification of ability according to standard scale so the first part of the book is taken up with an attempt to provide one the method employed is based on the law commonly known to mathematicians as that of frequency of error because it was devised by them to discover the frequency with which various proportionate amounts of error might be expected to occur in astronomical and geodetical operations and thereby to estimate the value that was probably nearest the truth from a mass of slightly discordant measures of the same fact its application has been extended by quetelet to the proportion of the human body on the grounds that the differences say in stature between men of the same race might theoretically be treated as if they were errors made by nature in her attempt to mould individual men of the same race according to the same ideal pattern fantastic as such a notion may appear to be when it is expressed in these bare terms without an accompaniment of a full explanation it can be shown to rest on a perfectly just basis moreover the theoretical predictions were found by him to be correct and their correctness in analogues cases under reasonable reservations has been confirmed by multitudes of subsequent observations of which perhaps the most noteworthy are those of professor wilden on that human creature the common shrimp proc royal society page two volume fifty one eighteen ninety two one effect of the law may be expressed under this form though it is not that which was used by quetelet suppose one hundred adult englishmen to be selected at random and ranged in the order of their statues in a row the statues of the fiftieth and fifty-first men almost identical and would represent the average of all the statues then the difference according to the law of frequency between them and the sixty-third man would be the same as that between the sixty-third and the seventy-fifth the seventy-fifth and the eighty-fourth the eighty-fourth and the ninetieth the intervening men between these divisions whose numbers are thirteen twelve nine and six form a succession of classes diminishing as we see in numbers but each separated from its neighbour by equal grades of stature the diminution of the successive classes is thus far small but it would be found to proceed at an enormously accelerated rate if a much longer road than that of one hundred men were taken and if the classification were pushed much farther as is fully shown in this book after some provisional verification i applied this law to mental faculties working it backwards in order to obtain a scale of ability and to be enabled thereby to give precision to the epithets employed thus the rank of four thousand or thereabouts is expressed by the word eminent the application of the law of frequency of error to mental faculties has now become accepted by many persons for it is found to accord well with observation i know of examiners who habitually use it to verify the general accuracy of the marks given to many candidates in the same examination also i am informed by one mathematician that before dividing his examinees into classes some regard is paid to this law there is nothing said in this book about the law of frequency that subsequent experience has not confirmed and even extended 
except that more emphatic warning is needed against its unchecked application. The next step was to gain a general idea as to the transmission of ability, founded upon a large basis of homogeneous facts by which to test the results that might be afterwards obtained from more striking but less homogeneous data. It was necessary, in seeking for these, to sedulously guard against any bias of my own. It was also essential that the group to be dealt with should be sufficiently numerous for statistical treatment, and again, that the family histories of the persons it contained should be accessible, and if possible, already published. The list at length adopted for this prefatory purpose was that of the English judges since the Reformation, their kinships were analysed, and their percentage of their eminent relations in their various near degrees were tabulated, and the results discussed. These were very striking, and seemed amply sufficient of themselves to prove the main question. Various objections to the validity of the inferences drawn from them may, however, rise. They are considered, and it is believed, disposed of in the book. After doing this, a series of lists were taken in succession of the most illustrious statesmen, commanders, literary men, men of science, poets, musicians and painters, of whom history makes mention. To each of these lists were added many English eminent men of recent times whose biographies are familiar, or, if not, are easily accessible. The lists were drawn up without any bias of my own, for I always relied mainly upon the judgment of others, exercised without any knowledge of the object of the present inquiry, such as the selections made by historians or critics. After the lists of the illustrious men had been disposed of, a large group of eminent Protestant divines were taken in hand, namely those who were included in Middleton's once well-known and highly esteemed biographical dictionary of such persons. Afterwards, the senior classics of Cambridge were discussed, then the North Country oarsmen and wrestlers. In the principal lists, all the selected names were inserted, in which those who were known to have eminent kinsmen were printed in italics, so the proportion of failures can easily be compared with that of the successes. Each list was followed, as the list of the judges have been, with a brief dictionary of kinships, all being afterwards tabulated and discussed in the same way. Finally, the various results were brought together and compared, showing a remarkable general agreement with a few interesting exceptions. One of these exceptions lay in the preponderating influence of the maternal side in the case of the divines. This was discussed and apparently accounted for. The remainder of the volume is taken up with topics that are suggested by the results of the former portion, such as the comparative worth of different races, the influence that affect the natural ability of nations, and finally a chapter of general considerations. If the work were rewritten, the part of the last chapter which refers to Darwin's provisional theory of pangenesis would require a vision, and ought to be largely extended in order to deal with the evidence for and against the hereditary of habits that were not inborn, but had been acquired through practice. Marvellous as is the power of the theory of pangenesis in bringing large classes of apparently different phenomena under a single law, serious objections have since arisen to its validity and prevented its general acceptance. It would, for example, almost compel us to believe that the hereditary transmission of accidental mutilations and of acquired aptitudes would be the rule and not the exception, but leaving out of the question all theoretical reasons against this belief, such as those which I put for myself many years ago as well as the more cogent ones adducted by Weissman in later years. Putting these wholly aside, and appealing to experimental evidence, it is now certain that the tendency of acquired habits to be hereditarily transmitted is at the most extremely small. There may be some few cases, like those of brown sequard guinea pigs, in which injury to the nervous substance of the parents affects their offspring, but as a general rule, with scarcely any exception, that cannot be ascribed to other influences, such as bad nutrition or transmitted microbes, the injuries or habits of the parents are found to have no effect on the natural form or faculties of the child. Whether very small hereditary influences of the supposed kind, accumulating in the same direction for many generations, may not ultimately affect the qualities of the species, seems to be the only point now seriously in question. Many illustrations have been offered by those few persons of high authority who still maintain their acquired habits, such as the use or disuse of particular organs in the parents, and may have been hereditarily transmitted in a sufficient degree to notably affect the whole breed after many generations. Among these illustrations, much stress has been laid on the diminishing size of the human jaw in highly civilized peoples. It is urged that their food is better cooked and more toothsome than that of their ancestors. Consequently, the masticating apparatus of the race has dwindled through disuse. 
the truth of the evidence on which this argument rests is questionable because it is not at all certain that non-european races who have more powerful jaws than ourselves use them more than we do a chinaman lives and has lived for centuries on rice and spoon meat or such overboiled diet as his chopsticks can deal with equatorial africans live to a great extent on bananas or else on cassava which being usually of the poisonous kind must be well boiled before it is eaten in order to destroy the poison many of the eastern archipelago islanders live on sago pastoral tribes eat meat occasionally but their usual diet is milk or curds it is only the hunting tribes who habitually live upon tough meat it follows that the diminishing size of the human joys in highly civilized people must be ascribed to other causes such as those whatever they may be that reduce the weight of the whole skeleton in delicately nurtured animals it seems feasible to subject the question to experiment whether certain acquired habits acting during at least ten twenty or more generations have any sensible effects on the race i will remarks on this subject which i made two years ago first in a paper read at a congress in paris and afterwards at the british association at newcastle the position taken was that the experiments ought to be made on a large scale and upon creatures that were artificially hatched and therefore wholly isolated from maternal teachings fowls moths and fish were the particular creatures suggested fowls are reared in incubators at very many places on a large scale especially in france it seems not difficult to devise practices associated with peculiar calls to food with colours connected with food or with food that was found to be really good through deterrent in appearance and in certain of the breeding places to regularly subject the chicks to these practices then after many generations had passed by to examine whether or no the chicks of the then generation had acquired any instinct for performing them by comparing their behaviour with that of chicks reared in other places as regards moths the silkworm industry is so extensive and well understood that there would be abundant opportunity for analogous experiments with moths both in france and italy the establishments for pisciculture afford another field it would not be worth while to initiate courses of such experiments unless the crucial value of what they could teach us when completed had first been fully assented to to my own mind they would rank as crucial experiments so far as they went and be worth undertaking but they did not appear to strike others so strongly in the same light of course before any such experiments were set on foot they would have to be considered in detail by many competent minds and be closely criticised another topic would have been treated at more length if this book were rewritten namely the distinction between variations and sports it would even require remodelling of much of the existing matter the views i have been brought to entertain since it was written are amplifications of those which are already put forward in page three hundred and fifty four to five but insufficiently pushed there to their logical conclusion they are that the word variation is used indiscriminately to express two fundamentally distinct conceptions sports and variations properly so called it has been shown in natural inheritance that the distribution of faculties in a population cannot possibly remain constant if on the average the children resemble their parents if they did so the giants in any mental or physical particular would become more gigantic and the dwarfs more dwarfish in each successive generation the counteracting tendency is what i called regression the filial centre is not the same as the parental centre but it is nearer to mediocrity it regresses towards the racial centre in other words the filial centre or the fraternal centre if we change the point of view is always nearer on the average to the racial centre than the parental centre was there must be an average regression in passing from the parental to the filial centre it is impossible briefly to give a full idea in this place either of the necessity or of the proof of regression they have been thoroughly discussed in the work in question suffice it to say that the result gives presidia of a typical centre from which individual variations occur in accordance with the law of frequency often to a small amount more rarely to a larger one very rarely indeed to one that is much larger and practically never to one that is larger still the filial centre falls back further towards mediocrity in a constant proportion to the distance to which the parental centre has deviated from it whether the direction of the deviation be in excess or in deficiency all true variations are as i maintain of this kind and it is in consequence impossible that the natural qualities of a race may be permanently changed through the action of a selection upon mere variations 
the selection of the most serviceable variations cannot even produce any great degree of artificial and temporary improvement because an equilibrium between deviation and regression will soon be reached whereby the best of the offspring will cease to be better than their own sires and dams the case is quite different in respect to what are technically known as sports in these a new character suddenly makes its appearance in a particular individual causing him to differ distinctly from his parents and from others of his race such new characters are also found to be transmitted to descendants here there have been a change of typical centre a new point of departure has somehow come into existence towards which regression has henceforth to be measured and consequently a real step forward has been made in the course of evolution when natural selection favours a particular sport it works effectively towards the formation of a new species but the favour that it simultaneously shows to mere variations seems to be thrown away so far as that end it concerned there may be entanglement between a sport and a variation which leads to a hybrid and unstable result well exemplified in the imperfect character of the fusion of different human races here numerous pure specimens of their ancestral types are apt to crop out notwithstanding the intermixture by marriage that had been going on for many previous generations it has occurred to others as well as myself as to mr wallace and to professor romains that the time may have arrived when an institute for experiments on hereditary might be established with advantage a farm and garden of a very few acres with varied exposure and well supplied with water placed under the charge of intelligent caretakers supervised by a biologist would afford the necessary basis for a great variety of research upon inexpensive animals and plants the difficulty lies in the smallness of their number of competent persons who are actively engaged in hereditary inquiry who could be depended upon to use it properly the direct result of this inquiry is to make manifest the great and measurable differences between the mental and bodily faculties of individuals and to prove that the laws of hereditary are as applicable to the former as to the latter its indirect result is to show that a vast but unused power is vested in each generation over the very natures of their successors that is over their inborn faculties and dispositions the brute power of doing this by means of appropriate marriages or abstention from marriage undoubtedly exists however much the circumstances of life may hamper its employment the great problem of the future betterment of the human race is confessedly at the present time hardly advanced beyond the stage of academic interest but thought and action move swiftly nowadays and it is by no means impossible that a generation which has witnessed the exclusion of the chinese race from the customary privileges of settlers in two continents and the deportation of a hebrew population from a large portion of a third may live to see other anachronous acts performed under sudden socialistic pressure the striking results of an evil inheritance have already forced themselves so far on the popular mind that indignation is freely expressed without any marks of disapproval from others at the yearly output by unfit parents of weakly children who are constitutionally incapable of growing up into serviceable citizens and who are a serious encumbrance to the nation the question about to be considered may unexpectedly acquire importance as falling within the sphere of practical politics and if so many demographic data that require forethought and time to collect and a dispassionate and leisurely judgment to discuss will be hurriedly and sorely needed the topics to which i refer are the relative fertility of different classes and races and the tendency to supplant one another under various circumstances the whole question of fertility under the various conditions of civilized life requires more detailed research than it has yet received we require further investigations into the truth of the hypothesis of malthus that there is really no limit to overpopulation beside that which is affordable by misery or prudential restraint is it true that misery in any justifiable sense of that word provides the only check which acts automatically or are other causes in existence active though as yet obscure that assist in restraining the overgrowth of population it is certain that the productiveness of different marriages differs greatly in consequence of unexplained conditions the variation in fertility of different kinds of animals that have been captured then wild and afterwards kept in menageries is as darwin long since pointed out most notable and apparently capricious the majority of those which thrive in confinement and apparently enjoy excellent health are nevertheless absolutely infertile others often of closely allied species had their productivity increased one of the many evidences of burr great ignorance of the laws that govern infertility is seen in the behaviour of bees 
we have somehow discovered that by merely modifying the diet and the size of the nursery of any female grub they can at will cause it to develop either into a naturally sterile worker or into a potential mother of a huge hive demographers have undoubtedly collected and collated a vast amount of information bearing on the fertility of different nations but they have mainly attacked the problem in the gross and not in the detail so that we possess little more than mean values that are to general populations and are very valuable in their way but we remain ignorant of much else that a moderate amount of judiciously directed research might perhaps be able to tell as an example of what could be sought with advantage let us suppose that we take a number sufficient for statistical purposes of persons occupying different social classes those who are the least efficient in physical intellectual and moral grounds forming our lowest class and those who are the most efficient forming our highest class the question to be solved relates to the hereditary permanence of the several classes what proportion of each class is described from parents who belong to the same class and what proportion is described from parents who belong to each of the other classes to these persons who have honourably succeeded in life and who are presumably on the whole the most valuable portion of our human stock contribute on the aggregate their fair share of posterity to the next generation if not do they contribute more or less than their fair share and in what degree in other words is the evolution of man in each particular country favourably or injuriously affected by its special form of civilization enough is already known to make it certain that the productiveness of both the extreme classes the best and the worst falls short of the average of the nation as a whole therefore the most prolific class necessarily lies between the two extremes but at what intermediate point does it lie taken altogether on any reasonable principle are the natural gifts of the most prolific class bodily intellectual and moral above or below the line of national mediocrity if above that line then the existing conditions are favourable to the improvement of the race if they are below that line they must work towards its degradation these very brief remarks serve to shadow out the problem it would require much more space than is now available before it could be phrased in a way free from ambiguity so that its solution would clearly instruct us whether the conditions of life at any period in any given race were tending to raise or to depress its natural qualities whatever other countries may or may not have lost ours has certainly gained on more than one occasion by the infusion of the breed of selected sub-races especially of that of the protestant refugees from religious persecution on the continent it seems reasonable to look upon the huguenots as men who on the whole had inborn qualities of a distinctive kind from the majority of their countrymen and who may therefore be spoken of as a subtype that is to say capable when isolated of continuing their race without its showing any strong tendency to revert to the form of the earlier type from which it was a well-defined departure it proved also that the cross-breed between them and our ancestors was a singularly successful mixture consequently england has been largely indebted to the natural refinement and to the solid worth of the huguenot breed as well as to the culture and technical knowledge that the huguenots brought with them the frequency in history with which one race has supplanted another over wide geographical areas is one of the most striking facts in the evolution of mankind the denizens of the world at the present day form a very different human stock to that which inhabited it a dozen generations ago and to all appearance a no less difference will be found in our successors a dozen of generations hence partially it may be that new human varieties have come into permanent or only into temporary existence like that most remarkable mixed race of the normans many centuries ago in whom to use well-known words of the late professor freeman the indomitable figure of the scandinavians joined to the buoyant vivacity of the gaul produced the conquering and ruling race of europe but principally the change of which i spoke is due to great alterations in the proportion of those who belong to the old and veil established types the negro now born in the united states has much the same natural faculties as his distant cousin who is born in africa the effect of his transplantation being ineffective in changing his nature but very effective in increasing his numbers in enlarging the range of his distribution and in destroying native american races there are now some eight million of negroes in lands where not one of them existed twelve generations ago and probably not one representative of the race which they displace remains there on the other hand there has been no corresponding diminution of numbers in the parent home of the negro precisely the same may be said of the european races who have during the same period swarmed over the temperate regions of the globe forming the nuclei of many future nations 
it is impossible even in the vaguest way in a brief space to give a just idea of the magnitude and variety of changes produced in the human stock by the political events of the last few generations and it would be difficult to do so in such a way as not to seriously wound the patriotic susceptibilities of many readers the natural temperaments and moral ideals of different races are various and praise or blame cannot be applied at the discretion of one person without exciting remonstrance from others who take different views with perhaps equal justice the birds and beasts assembled in conclave may try to pass a unanimous resolution in favour of the natural duty of the mother to nurture and protect her offspring but the cup who would musically protest the irish celt may desire the extension of his race and the increase of its influence in the representative governments of england and america but the wishes of his anglo-saxon or teuton fellow subjects may lie in the opposite direction and so on indefinitely my object now is merely to urge inquiries into the historical fact whether legislation which has led to the substitution on a large scale of one race for another has not often been the outcome of conflicting views into which the question of race hardly entered at all and which were so nearly balanced that if the question of race had been properly introduced into the discussion the result might have been different the possibility of such being the case cannot be doubted and affords strong reason for justly appraising the influence of race and of hereafter including it at neither more nor less than its real value among the considerations by which political action will be determined the importance to be attached to race is a question that deserves a far larger measure of exact investigation than it receives we are exceedingly ignorant of the respective ranges of the natural and acquired faculties in different races and there is too great a tendency among writers to dogmatize wildly about them some grossly magnifying others as greatly minimizing their several provinces it seems however possible to answer this question unambiguously difficult as it is the recent attempts of many european nations to utilize africa for their own purposes gives immediate and practical interest to inquiries that bear on the transplantation of races they compel us to face the question as to what races should be politically aided to become hereafter the chief occupiers of that continent the varieties of negroes bantus arab half-breeds and others who now inhabit africa are very numerous and they differ much from one another in their natural qualities some of them must be more suitable than others to thrive under the form of moderate civilization which is likely to be introduced into africa by europeans who will enforce justice and order excite a desire among the natives for comforts and luxuries and make steady industry almost a condition of living at all such races would spread and displace the others by degrees what may prove that the negroes one and all will fail as completely under the new conditions as they have failed under the old ones to submit to the needs of a superior civilization to their own in this case their races numerous and prolific as they are will in course of time be supplanted and replaced by their betters it seems scarcely possible as yet to assure ourselves as to the possibility of any variety of white men to work to thrive and to continue their race in the broad regions of the tropics we could not do so without better knowledge than we now possess of the different capacities of individuals to withstand their malarious and climatic influences much more care is taken to select appropriate varieties of plants and animals for plantation in foreign settlements than to select appropriate types of men discrimination and foresight are shown in the one case and indifference born of ignorance is shown in the other the importance is not yet sufficiently recognized of a mere exact examination and careful record than is now made of the physical qualities and hereditary antecedents of candidates for employment in tropical countries we require these records to enable us to learn hereafter what are the conditions in youth that are prevalent among those whose health subsequently endured the change of climatic influence satisfactorily and conversely as regards those who failed it is scarcely possible to properly conduct such an investigation retrospectively in conclusion i wish again to emphasize the fact that the improvement of the natural gifts of future generations of the human race is largely through indirectly under our control we may not be able to originate but we can guide the processes of evolution are in constant and spontaneous activity some pushing towards the bad some towards the good our part is to watch for opportunities to intervene by checking the former and giving free play to the latter we must distinguish clearly between our power in this fundamental respect and that which we also possess of ameliorating education and hygiene it is earnestly to be hoped that inquiries will be increasingly directed into historical facts with a view of estimating the possible effects of reasonable political action in the future in gradually raising the present miserably low standard 
of the human race to one in which the utopias in the dreamland of philanthropists may become practical possibilities. End of prefatory chapter to the edition of 1892section one of hereditary genius by francis galton this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org recorded by leon harvey introductory chapter i propose to show in this book that a man's natural abilities are derived by inheritance under exactly the same limitations as are the form and physical features of the whole organic world Consequently, as it is easy, notwithstanding those limitations, to obtain by careful selection a permanent breed of dogs or horses gifted with peculiar powers of running, or of doing anything else, so it would be quite practical to produce a highly gifted race of men by judicious marriages during several consecutive generations. I shall show that social agencies of an ordinary character, whose influences are little suspected, are at this moment working towards the degradation of human nature and that others are working towards its improvement. I conclude that each generation has enormous power over the natural gifts of those that follow, and that maintain that it is a duty we owe to humanity to investigate the range of that power, and to exercise it in a way that, without being unwise towards ourselves, shall be most advantageous to future inhabitants of the earth. I am aware that my views, which were first published four years ago in Macmillan's magazine in June and August 1865, are in contradiction to general opinion, but the arguments I then used have been since accepted, to my great gratification, by many of the highest authorities on hereditary. In reproducing them, as I now do, in a much more elaborate form, and on a greatly enlarged basis of induction, I feel assured that, inasmuch as what I then wrote was sufficient to earn the acceptance of Mr. Darwin, Domestication of Plants and Animals, I.I. 7, the increased amount of evidence submitted in the present volume is not likely to be gainsaid. The general plan of my argument is to show that high reputation is a pretty accurate test of high ability. Next, to discuss the relationships of a large body of fairly eminent men, namely, the judges of England from 1660 to 1868, the statesmen of the time of George III, and the premiers during the last 100 years, and to obtain from these a general survey of the laws of hereditary in respect to genius. Then I shall examine in order the kindred of the most illustrious commanders, men of literature, and of science, poets, painters, and musicians, of whom history speaks. I shall also discuss the kindred of a certain selection of divines and of modern scholars. Then will follow a short chapter by way of comparison on the hereditary transmission of physical gifts, as deduced from the relationships of a certain classes of oarsmen and wrestlers. Lastly, I shall collate my results and draw conclusions. It will be observed that I deal with more than one grade of ability, those upon whom the greater part of my volume is occupied, and on whose kinships my argument is most securely based, have been generally reputed as endowed by nature with extraordinary genius. There are so few of these men that, although they are scattered throughout the whole historical period of human existence, their number does not amount to more than 400, and yet a considerable proportion of them will be found to be interrelated. Another grade of ability with which I deal is that which includes numerous, highly eminent, and all the illustrious names of modern English history, whose immediate descendants are living among us, whose histories are popularly known, and whose relationships may readily be traced by the help of biographical dictionaries, peerages, and similar books of reference. A third and lower grade is that of the English judges, massed together as a whole, for the purpose of the prefatory statistical inquiry of which I have already spoken. No one doubts that many of the ablest intellects of our race are to be found among the judges. Nevertheless, the average ability of a judge cannot be rated as equal to that of the lower of the two grades I have described. I trust the reader will make allowances for a large and somewhat important class of omissions I have felt myself compelled to make when treating of the eminent men of modern days. I am prevented by a sense of decorum from quoting names of their relations in contemporary life who are not recognised as public characters. Although their abilities may be highly appreciated in private life, still less consistent with decorum would it have been to introduce the names of female relatives that stand in the same category. My case 
so is overpoweringly strong that i am perfectly able to prove my point without having recourse to this class of evidence nevertheless the reader should bear in mind that it exists and i beg he will do me the justice of allowing that i have not overlooked the whole of the evidence that does not appear in my pages i am deeply conscious of the imperfections of my work but my sins are those of omissions not of commission such errors as i may and must have made which give a fictitious support to my arguments are i am confident out of all proportion fewer than such omissions of facts as would have helped to establish them i have taken little notice in this book of modern men of eminence who are not english or at least well known to englishmen i feared if i included large classes of foreigners they should make glaring errors it requires a very great deal of labour to hunt out relationships even with the facilities afforded to a countryman having access to persons acquainted with the various families much more would have been difficult to hunt out the kindred of foreigners i should have especially liked to investigate the biographies of italians and jews both of whom appear to be rich in families of high intellectual breeds germany and america are also full of interest it is a little less so with respect to france where the revolution and the guillotine made such havoc among the progeny of her abler races there is one advantage to a candid critic in my having left so large a field untouched it enables me to propose a test that any well-informed reader may easily adopt who doubts the fairness of my examples he may most reasonably suspect that i have been unconsciously influenced by my theories to select men whose kindred were most favourable to their support if so i beg he will test my impartiality as follows let him take a dozen names of his own selection as the most eminent in whatever profession and in whatever country he knows most about and let him trace out for himself their relations it is necessary as i find by experience to take some pains to be sure that none even of the immediate relatives on either the male or female side have been overlooked if he does what i propose i am confident he will be astonished at the completeness with which the results will confirm my theory i venture to speak with assurance because it has often occurred to me to propose this very test to incredulous friends and invariably so far as my memory serves me as large a proportion of the men who were named were discovered to have eminent relations as the nature of my views on hereditary would have led me to expect end of section one chapter two of hereditary genius by francis galton this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit LibriVox.org. recorded by leon harvey chapter two classification of men according to their reputation the arguments by which i endeavour to prove that genius is hereditary consist in showing how large is the number of instances in which men who are more or less illustrious have eminent kinsfolk it is necessary to have clear ideas on the two following matters before my arguments can be rightly appreciated the first is the degree of selection implied by the words eminent and illustrious does eminent mean the foremost in a hundred in a thousand or in what other number of men the second is the degree to which reputation may be accepted as a test of ability it is essential that i who write should have a minimum qualification distinctly before my eyes whenever i employ the phrase eminent and the like and that the reader should understand as clearly as myself the value i attach to those qualifications an explanation of these words will be the subject of the present chapter a subsequent chapter will be given to the discussion of how far eminence may be accepted as criterion of natural gifts it is almost needless for me to insist that the subjects of these two chapters are entirely distinct i look upon social and professional life as a continuous examination all are candidates for the good opinions of others and for success in their several professions and they achieve success in proportion as the general estimate is large of their aggregate merits in ordinary scholastic examinations marks are allotted in stated proportions to various specific subjects as many for latin so many for greek so many for english history and the rest the world in the same way but almost unconsciously allots marks to men it gives them for originality of conception for enterprise for activity and energy for administrative skill for various acquirements for power of literary expression for oratory and much besides of general value as well as for more specifically professional merits it is not a lot of these marks according to a proportion that can easily be stated in words 
but there is a rough common sense that governs its practice with a fair approximation to constancy those who have gained most of these tacit marks are ranked by the common judgment of the leaders of opinion as the foremost men of their day the metaphor of an examination may be stretched much further as there are alternative groups in any one of which a candidate may obtain honours so it is with reputations they may be made in law literature science art and in a host of other pursuits again as the mere attainment of a general fair level will obtain no honours in an examination no more will it do so in the struggle for eminence a man must show conspicuous power in at least one subject in order to achieve a high reputation let us see how the world classifies people after examining each of them in her patient persistent manner during the years of their manhood how many men of eminence are there and what proportion do they bear to the whole community i will begin by analyzing a very painstaking biographical handbook lately published by rotledge and co called men of the time its intention which is fairly honestly carried out is to include none but those whom the world honours for their ability the catalogue of names is two thousand five hundred and a full half of it consists of american and continental celebrities it is well i should give in a footnote an analysis of its contents in order to show the exhaustive character of its range the numbers i prefix to each class are not strictly accurate for i measured them off rather than counted them but they are quite close enough the same name often appears under more than one head on looking over the book i am surprised to find how large a proportion of the men of the time are past middle age it appears that in the cases of high but by no means in that of the highest merit a man must outlive the age of fifty to be sure of being widely appreciated it takes time for an able man born in the humbler ranks of life to emerge from them and to take his natural position it would not therefore be just to compare the number of english men in the book with that of the whole adult male population of the british isles but it is necessary to confine our examination to those of the celebrities who are past fifty years of age and to compare their number with that of the whole male population who are also above fifty years i estimate from examining a large part of the book that there are about eight hundred and fifty of these men and that five hundred of them are decidedly well known to persons familiar with literary and scientific society now there are about two millions of adult males in the british isles above fifty years of age consequently the total number of the men of the time are about four hundred and twenty five to a million and the more select part of them as two hundred fifty to a million the qualifications for belonging to what i call the more select part are in my mind that a man should have distinguished himself pretty frequently either by purely original work or as a leader of opinion i wholly exclude notoriety obtained by a single act this is a fairly well-defined line because there is not room for many men to be eminent each interest or idea has its mouthpiece and a man who has attained and can maintain his position as the representative of a party or an idea naturally becomes much more conspicuous than his coadjutors who are nearly equal but inferior in ability this is eminently the case in positions where eminence may be won by official acts the balance may be turned by a grain that decides whether a b or c shall be promoted to a vacant post the man who obtains it has opportunities of distinction denied to the others i do not however take much note of official rank people who have left very great names behind them have mostly done so through non-professional laborers i certainly should not include mere officials except at the highest ranks and in open professions among my select list of eminent men another estimate of the proportion of eminent men to the whole population was made on a different basis and gave much the same result i took the obituary of the year eighteen sixty eight published in the times on january first eighteen sixty nine and found in it about fifty names of men of the more select class this was in one sense a broader and in another a more rigorous selection than that which i have just described it was broader because i included the names of many whose abilities were high but who died too young to have earned the wide reputation they deserved and it was more rigorous because i excluded old men who have earned distinction in years gone by but had not shown themselves capable in later times to come again to the front on the first ground it was necessary to lower the limit of the age of the population with whom they should be compared forty-five years of age seemed to be a fair limit including as it was supposed to do a year or two of broken health preceding decease now two hundred and ten thousand males die annually in the british isles above the age of forty-five therefore the ratio of the more select proportion of the men of the time on these data is as fifty to two hundred and ten thousand or as two hundred thirty-eight to a million thirdly 
I consulted obituaries of many years back when the population of these islands was much smaller, and they appeared to me to lead to similar conclusions, viz. that 250 to a million is an ample estimate. There would be no difficulty in making a further selection out of these, to any degree of rigour. We could select the 200, the 100, or the 50 best out of the 250 without much uncertainty, but I do not see my way to work downwards. If I were asked to choose the thousand per million best men, I should feel we have descended to a level where there existed no sure data for guidance, where accident and opportunity had undue influence, and where it was impossible to distinguish general eminence from local reputation or from mere notoriety. The considerations of the sense in which I propose to employ the word eminent. When I speak of an eminent man, I mean one who has achieved a position that is attained by only 250 persons in each million of men, or by one person in each 4,000. 4,000 is a very large number, difficult for persons to realise who are not accustomed to deal with great assemblages. On the most brilliant of starlit nights, there are never so many as 4,000 stars visible to the naked eye at the same time, yet we feel it to be an extraordinary distinction to a star to be accounted as the brightest in the sky. This, be it remembered, is my narrowest area of selection, I propose to introduce to name whatever into my list of kinsmen, unless it be marked off from the rest by brackets, that is less distinguished. The mass of those with whom I deal are far more rigidly selected. Many are as one in a million, and not a few as one of many millions. I use the term illustrious when speaking of these. They are men whom the whole intelligent part of the nation mourns when they die, who have or deserve to have a public funeral, and who rank in future ages as historical characters. Permit me to add a word upon the meaning of a million, being a number so enormous as to be difficult to conceive. It is well to have a standard by which to realise it. Mine will be understood by many Londoners. It is as follows. One summer day I passed the afternoon in Bushy Park to see the magnificent spectacle of its avenue of horse chestnut trees, a mile long in full flower. As the hour was past it, it occurred to me to try to count the number of spikes of flowers facing the drive on one side of the long avenue. I mean all the spikes that were visible in full sunshine on one side of the road. Accordingly, I fixed upon a tree of average bulk and flower, and drew imaginary lines, first halving the tree, then quartering, and so on, until I arrived at a subdivision that was not too large to allow of my counting the spikes of flowers it included. I did this with three different trees, and arrived at pretty much the same result, as well as I could recollect the three estimates were as nine ten and eleven then i counted the trees in the avenue and multiplying all together i found the spikes to be just about one hundred thousand in number ever since then whenever a million is mentioned i recall the long perspective of the avenue of bushy park with its stately chestnuts clothed from top to bottom with spikes of flowers bright in the sunshine and i imagined a similarly continuous floral band of ten miles in length in illustration of the value of the extreme rigour implied by a selection of one in a million, I will take the following instance. The Oxford and Cambridge boat race exists almost a national enthusiasm, and the men who represent their universities as competing crews have good reason to be proud of being the selected champions of such large bodies. The crew of each boat consists of eight men, selected out of about 800 students, namely the available undergraduates of about two successive years. In other words, the selection that is popularly felt to be so strict is only as one in a hundred. Now I suppose there had been so vast a number of universities that it would have been possible to bring together 800 men, each of whom had pulled in a university crew, and from this body the eight best were selected to form a special crew of comparatively rare merit. The selection of each of these would be as one in 10,000 ordinary men. Let this process be repeated and then, and not till then, do you arrive at a superlative crew representing selections of one in a million? This is a perfectly fair deduction because the use of the universities are a haphazard collection of men so far as regards their thews and sinews. No one is sent to a university on account of his powerful muscle, or to put the same facts into another form, it would require a period of about no less than two hundred years before either university could furnish eight men, each of whom would have sufficient boating eminence to rank as one of the medium crew. 20,000 years must elapse before eight men could be furnished, each of whom would have the rank of the superlative crew. It is, however, quite another matter with respect to brain power, for, as I shall have occasion to show, the universities attract to themselves a large proportion of the eminent scholastic talent of all England. 
there are nearly a quarter of million males in great britain who arrive each year at the proper age for going to the university therefore if cambridge for example conceived only one in every five of the ablest scholastic intellects she would be able in every period of ten years to boast of the fresh arrival of an undergraduate the rank of whose scholastic eminence was that of one in a million end of section two chapter three of hereditary genius by francis galton this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit LibriVox.org. recorded by leon harvey chapter three classification of men according to their natural gifts i have no patience with the hypothesis occasionally expressed as often implied especially in tales written to teach children to be good that babies are born pretty much alike arid that the sole agencies in creating differences between boy and boy and man and man are steady application and moral effort it is in the most unqualified manner that i object to pretensions of natural equality the experiences of the nursery the school the university and of professional careers are a chain of proofs or to the contrary i acknowledge fully the great power of education and social influences in developing the active powers of the mind just as i acknowledge the effect of use in developing the muscles of a blacksmith's arm and no further let the blacksmith labour as he will he will find there are certain feats beyond his power that are well within the strength of a man of herculean make even although the latter may have led a sedentary life some years ago the highlanders held a grand gathering in holland park where they challenged all england to compete with them in their games of strength the challenge was accepted and the well-trained men of the hills were beaten in the foot race by the youth who was stated to be a pure cockney the clerk of a london banker everybody who has trained himself to physical exercises discovers the extent of his muscular powers to a nicety when he begins to walk to row to use the dumbbells or to run he finds to his great delight that his thews strengthen and his endurance of fatigue increases day after day so long as he is a novice he perhaps flatters himself there is hardly an assignable limit to the education of his muscles but the daily gain is soon discovered to diminish and at last it vanishes altogether his maximum performance becomes a rigidly determined quantity he learns to an inch how high or how far he can jump when he has attained the highest state of training he learns to half a pound the force he can exert on the dynamometer by compressing it he can strike a blow against the machine used to measure impact and drive its index to a certain graduation but no further so it is in running in rowing in walking and in every other form of physical exertion there is a definite limit to the muscular powers of every man which he cannot by any education or exertion overpass this is precisely analogous to the experience that every student has had of the working of his mental powers the eager boy when he first goes to school and confronts intellectual difficulties is astonished at his progress he glories in his newly developed mental grip and growing capacity for application and it may be fondly believes it to be within his reach to become one of the heroes who have left their mark upon the history of the world the years go by he competes in the examinations of school and college over and over again with his fellows and soon finds his place among them he knows he can beat such and such of his competitors that there are some with whom he runs on equal terms and others whose intellectual feats he cannot even approach probably his vanity still continues to tempt him by whispering in a new strain it tells him that classics mathematics and other subjects taught in universities are more scholastic specialities and no test of the more valuable intellectual powers it reminds him of numerous instances of persons who had been unsuccessful in the competitions of youth but who had shown powers in after life that made them the foremost men of their age accordingly with newly furbished hopes and with all the ambition of twenty-two years of age he leaves his university and enters a larger field of competition the same kind of experience awaits him here that he has already gone through opportunities occur they occur to every man and he finds himself incapable of grasping them he tries and is tried in many things in a few years more unless he is incurably blinded by self-conceit he learns precisely of what performances he is capable and what other enterprises lie beyond his compass when he reaches mature life he is confident only within certain limits and knows or ought to know himself just as he is probably judged of by the world with all his unmistakable weaknesses and all his undeniable strength he is no longer tormented into hopeless efforts by the fallacious promptings of overweening vanity but he limits his undertakings to matters below the level of his reach and finds true moral repose in an honest conviction that he is engaged in as much good work 
as his nature has rendered him capable of performing. There can hardly be a surer evidence of the enormous difference between the intellectual capacity of men than the prodigious differences in the number of marks obtained by those who gain mathematical honours at Cambridge. I therefore crave permission to speak at some length upon this subject, although the details are dry and of little general interest. There are between 400 and 450 students who take their degrees in each year, and of these about 100 succeed in gaining honours in mathematics and are ranged by the examiners in strict order of merit. About the first 40 of those who take mathematical honours are distinguished by the title of wranglers, and it is a decidedly credible thing to be even a low wrangler. It will secure a fellowship in a small college. It must be carefully borne in mind that the distinction of being the first in this list of honours, or what is called the senior wrangler of the year, means a vast deal more than being the foremost mathematician of 400 or 450 men taken at haphazard. No doubt the larger bulk of Cambridge men are taken almost at haphazard. A boy is intended by his parents for some profession. If that profession be either the church or the bar, it used to be almost requisite, and it is still important that he should be sent to Cambridge or Oxford. These youths may justly be considered as having been taken at haphazard, but there are many others who have fairly won their way to the universities and are therefore selected from an enormous area. Fully one half of the wranglers have been boys of note at their respective schools, and conversely almost all boys of note at schools find their way to the universities. Here it is that among their comparatively small number of students, the universities include the highest youthful scholastic ability of all England. The senior wrangler in each successive year is the chief of these as regards mathematics, and this, the highest distinction, is or was continually won by youths who had no mathematical training of importance before they went to Cambridge. All their instruction had been received during the three years of their residence at the university. Now I do not say anything here about the merits or demerits of Cambridge mathematical studies having been directed along a too narrow groove, or about the presumed disadvantages of ranging candidates in strict order of merit, instead of grouping them, as at Oxford, in classes where the names appear alphabetically arranged. All I am concerned with here are the results, and these are most appropriate to my argument. The youths start on their three years race as fairly as possible. They are then stimulated to run by the most powerful inducements, namely those of competition, of honour, and of future wealth, for a good fellowship is wealth. And at the end of the three years, they are examined most rigorously according to a system that they all understand and are equally well prepared for. The examination lasts five and a half hours a day for eight days. All the answers are carefully marked by the examiners who add up the marks at the end and range the candidates in strict order of merit. The fairness and thoroughness of Cambridge examinations have never had a breath of suspicion cast upon them. Unfortunately for my purposes, the marks are not published. They are not even assigned on a uniform system, since each examiner is permitted to employ his own scale of marks, but whatever the scale he uses, the results as to proportional merit are the same. I am indebted to a Cambridge examiner for a copy of his marks in respect to two examinations, in which the scales of marks were so alike as to make it easy, by a slight proportional adjustment to compare the two together. This was, to a certain degree, a confidential communication, so that it would be improper for me to publish anything that would identify the years to which these marks refer. I simply give them as groups of figures, sufficient to show the enormous differences of merit. The lowest man at the list of honours gains less than 300 marks, the lowest wrangler gains about 1,500 marks, and the senior wrangler in one of the lists now before me gained more than 7,500 marks. Consequently, the lowest wrangler has more than five times the merit of the lowest junior optime, and less than one-fifth the merit of the senior wrangler. The results of two years are thrown into a single table. The total number of marks obtainable in each year was 17,000. Table is displayed on the page with two columns, number of marks obtained by candidates, and the number of candidates in two years taken together who obtained those marks. Under 500, 24 candidates. 500 to 1,000, 74 candidates. 1,000 to 1,500, 38 candidates. 1,500 to 2,000, 21 candidates. 2,000 to 2,500, 11 candidates. 2,500 to 3,000, 8 candidates. 3,000 to 3,500, 11 candidates. 3,500 to 4,000, 5 candidates. 4,000 to 4,500, 2 candidates. 4,500 to 5,000, 1 candidate. 5,000 to 5,500, 3 candidates. 5,500 to 6,000, 1 candidate. 
5,000 to 7,500, zero candidates. 7,500 to 8,000, one candidate. Total 200 candidates. The precise number of marks obtained by the senior Bangler in the more remarkable of these two years was 7,634. By the second Wrangler in the same year, 4,123. And by the lowest man in the list, 237. Consequently, the senior wrangler obtained nearly twice as many marks as the second wrangler, and more than 32 times as many as the lowest man. I have received from another examiner the marks of a year in which the senior wrangler was conspicuously eminent. He obtained 9,422 marks, whilst the second in the same year, whose merits were by no means inferior to those of second wranglers in general, obtained only 5,642. The man at the bottom of the same honour list had only 309 marks, or one thirtieth the number of the senior wrangler. I have some particulars of a fourth very remarkable year, in which the senior wrangler obtained no less than ten times as many marks as the second wrangler, in the problem paper. Now I have discussed with practice examiners the question of how far the numbers of marks may be considered as proportionate to the mathematical power of the candidate, and am assured they are strictly proportionate as regards the lower places, but do not afford full justice to the highest. In other words, the senior wranglers above mentioned had more than 30 or 32 times the ability of the lowest men on the list of honours. They would be able to grapple with problems more than 32 times as difficult, or when dealing with subjects of the same difficulty, but intelligible to all, would comprehend them more rapidly in perhaps the square root of that proportion. It is reasonable to expect that marks would do some injustice to the very best men, because a very large part of the time of the examination is taken up by the mechanical labour of writing. Whenever the thought of the candidate outruns his pen, he gains no advantage from his excess of promptitude in conception. I should, however, mention that some of the ablest men have shown their superiority by comparatively little writing. They find their way at once to the root of the difficulty in the problem that are set, and with a few cleaner prostate powerful strokes succeed in proving they can overthrow it, and then they can go on to another question. Every word they write tells. Thus the late Mr. H. Leslie Ellis, who was a brilliant senior wrangler in 1840 and whose name is familiar to many generations of Cambridge men as a prodigy of universal genius, did not even remain during the full period in the examination room. His health was weak, and he had to husband his strength. The mathematical powers of the last man on the list of honours, which are so low when compared with those of a senior wrangler, are mediocre, or even above mediocrity, when compared with the gifts of Englishmen generally. Though the examination places 100 honour men above him, it puts no less than 300 pole men below him. Even if we go so far as to allow that 200 out of the 300 refuse to work hard enough to get honours, there will remain 100 who, even if they worked hard, could not get them. Every tutor knows how difficult it is to drive abstract conceptions, even of the simplest kind, into the brains of most people. How feeble and hesitating is their mental grasp, how easily their brains are amazed, how incapable they are of precision and soundness of knowledge. It often occurs to persons familiar with some scientific subject to hear men and women of mediocre gifts relate to one another what they have picked up about it from some lecture, say at the Royal Institution, where they have sat for an hour listening with delighted attention to an admirably lucid account illustrated by experiments of the most perfect and beautiful character, in all of which they express themselves intensely gratified and highly instructed. It is positively painful to hear what they say. The recollections seem to be a mere chaos of mist of misapprehension. To some sort of shape and organization has been given by the action of their own pure fancy, although alien to what the lecturer intended to convey. The average mental grasp, even of what is called a well-educated audience, will be found to be ludicrously small when rigorously tested. In stating the differences between man and man, let it not be supposed for a moment that mathematicians are necessarily one-sided in their natural gifts. There are numerous instances of the reverse, of which the following will be found, as instances of hereditary genius, in an appendix to my chapter on science. I would especially name Leibniz as being universally gifted, but Ampere. Arago, Condorcet, D'Alembert, were all of them very far more than mere mathematicians. Nay, say the range of examination at Cambridge is so extended as to include other subjects besides mathematics, the differences of ability between the highest and lowest of the successful candidates is yet more glaring than what I have already described. 
we still find on the one hand mediocre men whose whole energies are absorbed in getting their 237 marks for mathematics and on the other hand some few senior wranglers who are at the same time high classical scholars and much more besides cambridge has afforded such instances its list of classical honours are comparatively of recent date but other evidence is obtainable from earlier times of their occurrence thus dr george butler the headmaster of harrow for many years including the period when byron was a schoolboy father of the present headmaster and of other sons two of whom are also headmasters of great public schools must have attained that classical office on account of his eminent classical ability but dr butler was also a senior wrangler in seventeen ninety four the year when lord chancellor lyndhurst was second both dr kane the late bishop of lincoln and sir e alderson the late judge were the senior wranglers and the first classical prizemen of their respective years since eighteen twenty four when the classical tripos was first established the late mr goulburn brother of dr goulburn dean of norwich and son of the well-known sergeant goulburn was second wrangler in eighteen thirty five and senior classic at the same year but in more recent times the necessary labour of preparation in order to acquire the highest mathematical places has become so enormous that there has been a wider differentiation of studies there is no longer time for a man to acquire the necessary knowledge to succeed in the first place in more than one subject there are therefore no instances of a man being absolutely first in both examinations but a few can be found of high eminence in both classics and mathematics as a reference to the list published in the cambridge calendar will show the best of the more recent degrees appears to be that of dr barry late principal of cheltenham and now principal of king's college london the son of the eminent architect sir charles barry and brother of mr edward barry who succeeded his father as architect he was fourth wrangler and seventh classic of his year in whatever we may test ability we arrive at equally enormous intellectual differences lord macaulay see under literature for his remarkable kinships had one of the most tenacious of memories he was able to recall many pages of hundreds of volumes by various authors which he had acquired by simply reading them over an average man could not certainly carry in his memory one thirty-second a or one hundredth part as much as lord macaulay the father of seneca had one of the greatest memories on record in ancient times see under literature for his kinships porson the greek scholar was remarkable for his gift and i may add the porson memory was hereditary in that family in statesmanship generalship literature science poetry art just the same enormous differences are found between man and man and numerous instances recorded in this book will show in how small degree eminence either in these or any other class of intellectual powers can be considered as due to purely special powers they are rather to be considered in those instances as a result of concentrated efforts made by men who are widely gifted people lay too much stress on apparent specialities thinking over rashly that because a man is devoted to some particular pursuit he could not possibly have succeeded in anything else they might just as well say that because a youth had fallen desperately in love with a brunette he could not possibly have fallen in love with a blonde he may or may not have more natural liking for the former type of beauty than the latter but it is as probable as not that the affair was mainly or wholly due to a general amorousness of disposition it is just the same with special pursuits a gifted man is often capricious and fickle before he selects his occupation but when it has been chosen he devotes himself to it with a truly passionate ardour after a man of genius has selected his hobby and so adapted himself to it as to seem unfitted for any other occupation in life and to be possessed of but one of special aptitude i often notice with admiration how well he bears himself with the circumstances suddenly thrust him into a strange position he will display an insight into new conditions and a power of dealing with them with which even his most intimate friends were unprepared to accredit him many a presumptuous fool has mistaken indifference and neglect for incapacity and in trying to throw a man of genius on ground where he was unprepared for attack has himself received a most severe and unexpected fall i am sure that no one who has had the privilege of mixing in the society of the abler man of any great capital or who is acquainted with the biographies of the heroes of history can doubt the existence of grand human animals of natures pre-eminently noble of individuals born to be kings of men i have been conscious of no slight misgiving that i was committing a kind of sacrilege whenever in the preparation of materials for this book i had occasion to take the measurement of modern intellects vastly superior to my own 
or to criticise the genius of the most magnificent historical specimens of our race it was a process that constantly recalled to me a once familiar sentiment in bygone days of african travel when i used to take altitudes of the huge cliffs that domineered above me as i travelled along their bases or to map the mountains and landmarks of unvisited tribes that loomed in faint grandeur beyond my actual horizon i have not cared to occupy myself much with people whose gifts are below the average but they would be an interesting study the number of idiots and imbeciles among the twenty million inhabitants of england and wales is approximately estimated at fifty thousand or as one in four hundred dr seguin a great french authority on these matters states that more than thirty per cent of idiots and imbeciles put under suitable instruction have been taught to conform to social and moral law and rendered capable of order of good feeling and of working like the third of an average man he says that for more than forty per cent have become capable of the ordinary transactions of life under friendly control of understanding moral and social abstractions and of working like two-thirds of a man and lastly that from twenty five to thirty per cent come nearer and nearer to the standard of manhood till some of them will defy the scrutiny of good judges when compared with ordinary young men and women in the order next above idiots and imbeciles are a large number of milder cases scattered among private families and kept out of sight the existence of whom is however well known to relatives and friends they are too silly to take a part in general society but are easily amused with some trivial harmless occupation then comes a class of whom the lord dundreary of the famous play may be considered a representative and so proceeding through successive grades we gradually ascend to mediocrity i know two good instances of hereditary silliness sort of imbecility and have reason to believe i could easily obtain a large number of similar facts to conclude the range of mental power between i will not say the highest caucasian and the lowest savage but between the greatest and least of english intellects is enormous there is a continuity of natural ability reaching from one knows not what height and descending to one can hardly say what depth i propose in this chapter to range men according to their natural abilities putting them into classes separated by equal degrees in merit and to show the relative number of individuals included in the several classes perhaps some persons might be inclined to make an off-hand guess that the number of men included in the several classes would be pretty equal if he thinks so i can assure him he is most egregiously mistaken the method i shall employ for discovering all this is an application of the very curious theoretical law of deviation from the average first i will explain the law and then i will show that the production of natural intellectual gifts comes justly within its scope the law is an exceedingly general one m quidlet the astronomer royal of belgium and the greatest authority on vital and social statistics has largely used it in his inquiries he has also conducted numerical tables by which the necessary calculations can be easily made whenever it is desired to have recourse to the law those who wish to learn more than i have space to relate should consult his work which is a very readable octavo volume and deserves to be far better known to statisticians than it appears to be his title is letters on probabilities translated by downs leighton and co london eighteen forty nine so much has been published in recent years about statistical deductions that i am sure the reader will be prepared to assert freely to the following hypothetical case suppose a large island inhabited by a single race who intermarried freely and who had lived for many generations under constant conditions then the average height of the male adults of that population would undoubtedly be the same year after year also still arguing from the experience of modern statistics which are found to give constant results in far less carefully guarded examples we should undoubtedly find year after year the same proportion maintained between the number of men of different heights i mean if the average stature was found to be sixty six inches and if it was also found in any one year that one hundred per million exceeded seventy eight inches the same proportion of one hundred per million would be closely maintained in all other years an equal constancy of proportion would be maintained between any other limits of height we please to specify as between seventy one and seventy two inches between seventy two and seventy three inches and so on statistical experiences are so invariably conformatory of what i have stated would probably be the case as to make it unnecessary to describe analogous instances now at this point the law of deviation from an average steps in it shows that the number per million whose heights range between seventy one and seventy two inches or between any other limits we please to name can be predicted 
from the previous datum of the average and of any one other fact such as that of 100 per million exceeding 78 inches the diagram on page 28 will make this more intelligible suppose a million of the men who stand in turns with their backs against a vertical board of sufficient height and their heights to be dotted off upon it the board would then present the appearance shown in the diagram the line of average height is that which divides the dots into two equal parts and stands in the case we have assumed at the height of sixty six inches the dots will be found to be ranged so symmetrically on either side of the line of average that the lower half of the diagram will be almost a precise reflection of the upper next let a hundred dots be counted from above downwards and let a line be drawn below them according to the conditions this line will stand at the height of seventy eight inches using the data afforded by these two lines it is possible by the help of the law of deviation from the average to reproduce with an extraordinary closeness the entire system of dots on the board m quidlet gives tables in which the uppermost line instead of cutting off one hundred in a million cuts off only one in a million he divides the intervals between the line and the line of the average into eighty equal divisions and gives the number of dots that fall within each of those deviations it is easy by the help of his tables to calculate what would occur under any other system of classification we please to adopt this law of deviation from an average is perfectly general in its application thus if the marks had been made by bullets fired at a horizontal line stretched in front of the target they would have been distributed according to the same law where a large number of similar events each due to the resultant influences of the same variable conditions two effects will follow first the average value of those events will be constant and secondly the deviations of the several events from the average will be governed by this law which is in principle the same as that which governs runs of luck at a gaming table the nature of the conditions affecting the several events must i say be the same it clearly would not be proper to combine the heights of men belonging to two dissimilar races in the expectation that the compound results would be governed by the same constants a union of two dissimilar systems of dots would produce the same kind of confusion as if half the bullets fired at a target had been directed to one mark and the other half at another mark nay an examination of the dots would show to a person ignorant of what had occurred that such had been the case and it would be possible by aid of the law to disentangle two or any moderate number of superimposed series of marks the law may therefore be used as a most trustworthy criterion whether or no the events of which an average has been taken are due to the same or to dissimilar classes of conditions i selected the hypothetical case of a race of men living on an island and freely intermarrying to ensure the conditions under which they were all supposed to live being uniform in character it will now be my aim to show there is sufficiently uniformity in the inhabitants of the british isles to bring them fairly within the grasp of this law for this purpose i first call attention to an example given in quidlet's book it is of the measurements of the circumferences of the chests of a large number of scotch soldiers the scotch are by no means a strictly uniform race nor are they exposed to identical conditions they are a mixture of celts danes anglo-saxons and others in various proportions the highlanders being almost purely celts on the other hand these races though diverse in origin are not very dissimilar in character consequently it will be found that their deviations from the average follow the theoretical computations with remarkable accuracy the instance is as follows m quidlet obtained his facts from the thirteenth volume of the edinburgh medical journal where the measurements are given in respect to five thousand seven hundred and thirty eight soldiers the results being grouped in order of magnitude proceeding by differences of one inch professor quidlet compares these results with those that his tables give and here is the result the marvellous accordance between fact and theory must strike the most unpractised eye i should say that for the sake of convenience both the measurements and calculations have been reduced to per thousandth the table is displayed on the page with six columns going down measurement of the chest in inches number of men per one thousand by experience number of men per one thousand by calculation measures of the chest in inches number of men per one thousand by experience number of men per one thousand by calculation i will now take a case where there is a greater dissimilarity in the elements of which the average has been taken it is the height of one hundred thousand french conscripts there is fully as much variety in the french as in the english 
for it is not very many generations since france was divided into completely independent kingdoms among its peculiar races are those of normandy brittany alsatia province bern Auvergne, each with their special characteristics yet the following table shows a most striking agreement between the results of experience compared with those derived by calculations from a purely theoretical hypothesis a table is displayed on the page height of men in inches and the number of men divided between measured and calculated the greatest differences are in the lowest ranks they include the men who were rejected for being too short for the army m quetelet boldly ascribes these differences to the effect of fraudulent returns it certainly seems that men have been improperly taken out of the second rank and put into the first in order to exempt them from service be this as it may the coincidence of fact with theory is in this instance also quite close enough to serve my purpose i argue from the results obtained from frenchmen and from scotchmen that if we had measurements of the adult males in the british isles we should find those measurements to range in close accordance with the law of deviation from the average although our population is as much mingled as i described that of scotland to have been and although ireland is mainly peopled of celts now if this be the case with stature then it will be true as regards every other physical feature as circumference of head size of brain weight of grey matter number of brain fibres etc and thence by a step on which no physiologist will hesitate as regards mental capacity this is what i am driving at that analogy clearly shows there must be a fairly constant average mental capacity in the inhabitants of the british isles and that the deviations from the average upwards towards genius and downwards towards stupidity must follow the law that governs deviations from all true averages i have however done somewhat more than rely on analogy i have tried the results of those examinations in which the candidates have been derived from the same classes most persons have noticed the lists of successful competitors for various public appointments that are published from time to time in the newspapers with the marks gained by each candidate attached to his name these lists contain far too few names to fall into such beautiful accordance with theory as was the case with the scotch soldiers there are rarely more than one hundred names in any one of these examinations while the chests of no less than five thousand seven hundred scotsmen were measured i cannot justly combine the marks of several independent examinations into one faggot for i understand that different examiners are apt to have different figures of merit so i have analysed each examination separately i give a calculation i made on the examination last before me it will do as well as any other it was for admission into the royal military college at sandhurst december eighteen sixty eight the marks obtained were clustered most thickly about three thousand so i take that number as representing the average ability of the candidates from this datum and from the fact that no candidate obtained more than six thousand five hundred marks i computed the column b in the following table by the help of quetelet's numbers it will be seen that column b accords with column a quite as closely as the small number of persons examined could have led us to expect a table is displayed on the page of five columns the number of marks obtained by candidates and the number of candidates who obtained those marks subdivided according to fact with a total and according to theory with a total an additional section with either did not venture to compete or were plucked the symmetry of the descending branch has been rudely spoilt by the conditions stated at the foot of column a there is therefore little room for doubt if everybody in england had to work object then to pass before examiners who employed similar figures of merit that their marks would be found to range according to the law of deviation from an average just as previously as the heights of french conscripts or the circumferences of the chests of scotch soldiers the number of grades into which we may divide ability is purely a matter of option we may consult our convenience by sorting englishmen into a few large classes or into many small ones i will select a system of classification that shall be easily comparable with the numbers of eminent men as described in the previous chapter we have seen that two hundred and fifty men per million became eminent accordingly i have so contrived the classes in the following table that the two highest f and g together with x which includes all cases beyond g and which are unclassed shall amount to about that number namely to two hundred and forty eight per million a table is displayed on the page classification of men according to their natural gifts tables divide up in several columns grades of natural ability separated by equal intervals 
subdivided between below average and above average another set of columns numbers of men comprised into the several grades of natural ability whether in respect to their general powers or to special aptitudes it is subdivided again into proportionate viz one in in each million of the same age and finally in a total male population of the united kingdom viz fifteen millions of the undetermined ages which is subdivided again into six separate columns of twenty to thirty thirty to forty forty to fifty fifty to sixty sixty to seventy and seventy to eighty the proportions of men at different ages are calculated from the proportions that are true for england and wales census 1861 appendix page 107 example the class f contains one in every four thousand three hundred men in other words there are 233 of that class in each million of men the same is true of class f in the whole united kingdom there are 590 men of class f and the same number of f between ages 20 and 30 450 between the ages of 30 and 40 and so on it will i trust be clearly understood that the numbers of men in the several classes in my table depend on no uncertain hypothesis they are determined by the assured law of deviations from an average it is an absolute fact that if we pick out of each million the one man who is naturally the ablest and also the one man who is the most stupid and divided the remaining nine hundred ninety nine thousand nine hundred ninety eight men into fourteen classes the average ability in each being separated from that of its neighbours by equal grades then the numbers in each of those classes will on the average of many millions be as is stated in the table the table may be applied as special just as truly as to general ability it would be true for every examination that brought out natural gifts whether held in painting in music or in statesmanship the proportions between the different classes would be identical in all these cases although the classes would be made up of different individuals according as the examination differed in its purport it will be seen that more than half of each million is contained in the two mediocre classes lowercase a and capital a the four mediocre classes lowercase a lowercase b capital a capital b contain more than four-fifths and the six mediocre classes more than nineteen twentieths of the entire population thus the rarity of commanding ability and the vast abundance of mediocrity is no accident but follows of necessity from the very nature of these things the meaning of the word mediocrity admits of little doubt it defines the standard of intellectual power found in most provincial gatherings because the attractions of a more stirring life in the metropolis and elsewhere are apt to draw away the able classes of men and the silly and the imbecile do not take a part in the gatherings hence the residuum that forms the bulk of the general society of small provincial places is commonly very pure in its mediocrity the class uppercase c possesses abilities a trifle higher than those commonly possessed by the foreman of the ordinary jury uppercase d includes the mass of men who obtain the ordinary prizes of life uppercase e is a stage higher then we reach uppercase f the lowest of those yet superior classes of intellect with which this volume is chiefly concerned on descending the scale we find by the time we have reached lowercase f that we are already among idiots and imbeciles we have seen in page twenty five there are four hundred idiots and imbeciles to every million of persons living in this country but that thirty per cent of their number appears to be like cases to whom the name of idiot is inappropriate there will remain two hundred and eighty true idiots and imbeciles to every million of our population this ratio coincides very closely with the requirements of class lowercase f no doubt a certain proportion of them are idiotic owing to some fortuitous cause which may interfere with the working of a naturally good brain much as a bit of dirt may cause a first-grade chronometer to keep worse time than an ordinary watch but i presume from the usual smallness of head and absence of disease among these persons that the proportion of accidental idiots cannot be very large hence we arrive at the undeniable but unexpected conclusion that eminently gifted men are raised as much above mediocrity as idiots are depressed below it a fact that is calculated to considerably enlarge our ideas of the enormous differences of intellectual gifts between man and man i presume the class uppercase f of dogs and other of more intelligent sort of animals is nearly commensurate with the lower class f of the human race in respect to memory and powers of reason certainly the class uppercase g of such animals is far superior to the lowercase g of humankind
End of chapter 3 of Hereditary Genius Chapter 4 of Hereditary Genius by Francis Galton This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recorded by Leon Harvey. Chapter 4. Comparison of the two classifications. Is reputation a fair test of natural ability? It is the only one I can employ, and I justify it in using it. How much of a man's success is due to his opportunities? How much to his natural power of intellect? This is a very old question on which a great many commonplaces have been uttered and need not be repeated here. I will confine myself to a few considerations, such as seem to me aptly adequate to prove what is wanted for my argument. Let it clearly be borne in mind what I mean by reputation and ability. By reputation I mean the opinion of contemporaries, revised by posterity, the favourable result of a critical analysis of each man's character by many biographers. I do not mean high social or official position, nor such as implied by being the mere lion of a London season, but I speak of the reputation of a leader of opinion, of an originator, of a man, to whom the world deliberately acknowledges itself largely indebted. By natural ability I mean those qualities of intellect and disposition which urge and qualify men to perform acts that lead to reputation. I do not mean capacity without zeal, nor zeal without capacity, nor even a combination of both of them without an adequate power of doing a great deal of very laborious work, but I mean a nature which, when left to itself, will, urged by an inherent stimulus, climb the path that leads to eminence, and has strength to reach the summit, one which, if hindered or thwarted, will fret and strive until the hindrance is overcome, and it is again free to follow its labor-loving instinct. It is almost a contradiction in terms to doubt that such men will generally become eminent, on the other hand, there is plenty of evidence in this volume to show that few have won high reputations without possessing these particular gifts. It follows that the men who achieve eminence and those who are naturally capable are to a large extent identical. The particular meaning in which I employ the word ability does not restrict my argument from a wider application, for if I succeed in showing, as I undoubtedly shall do, that the concrete triple event of ability combined with zeal and with capacity for hard labour is inherited, much more will there be justified for believing that any one of its three elements, whether it be ability, or zeal, or capacity for labour, is similarly a gift of inheritance. I believe, and shall do my best to show, that if the eminent men of any period had been changelings when babies, a very fair proportion of those who survived and retained their health up to fifty years of age would, notwithstanding their altered circumstances, have equally risen to eminence, Thus, to take a strong case, it is incredible that any combination of circumstances could have repressed Lord Brougham to the level of undistinguished mediocrity. The arguments on which I rely are as follow. I will limit their application for the present to men of the pen and to artists. First, it is a fact that numbers of men rise, before they are middle-aged, from the humbler ranks of life to that worldly position, to which it is of no importance to their future career, how their youth has been passed. They have overcome their hindrances and thus start fair with others more fortunately reared in the subsequent race for life. A boy who is to be carefully educated is sent to a good school, where he acquires little useful information, but where he is taught the art of learning. The man of whom I have been speaking has contrived to acquire the same art in a school of adversity. Both stand on equal terms when they have reached mature life. They compete for the same prizes, measure their strength by efforts in the same direction, and their relative successes are thenceward due to their relative natural gifts. There are many such men in the eminent class, as biographies abundantly show. Now, if the hindrances to success were very great, we should expect all who surmount them to be prodigious of genius. The hindrances would form a system of natural selection by repressing all whose gifts were below a certain very high level. But what is the case? We find very many who have risen from the ranks, who are by no means prodigious of genius, Many who have no claim to eminence, who have risen easily in spite of all obstacles. The hindrances undoubtedly form a system of natural selection that represses mediocre men, and even men of pretty fair powers. In short, the class is below upper D, but many of upper D succeed, a great many of upper E, and I believe a very large majority of those above. If a man is gifted with vast intellectual ability, eagerness to work, and power of working, I cannot comprehend how such a man should be repressed. 
The world is always tormented with difficulties waiting to be solved, struggling with ideas and feelings to which it can give no adequate expression. If then there exists a man capable of solving those difficulties or of giving a voice to those pent-up feelings, he is sure to be welcomed with universal acclamation. We may almost say that he has only to put his pen to paper, and the thing is done. I am here speaking of the very first class men, prodigies, one in a million, or one in ten millions, of whom numbers will be found described in this volume as specimens of hereditary genius. Another argument to prove that the hindrances of English social life are not effectual in repressing high ability is that the number of eminent men in England is as great as in other countries where fewer hindrances exist. Culture is far more widely spread in America than with us, and the education of their middle and lower classes far more advanced, but for all that America most certainly does not beat us in first-class works of literature, philosophy, or art. The higher kind of books, even of the most moderate date, read in America, are principally the work of Englishmen. The Americans have an immense amount of the newspaper article writer, or of the member of Congress stamp of ability, but the number of their really eminent authors is more limited even than with us. I argue that, if the hindrances of the rise of genius were removed from English society as completely as they have been removed from that of America, we should not become materially richer in highly eminent men. People seem to have the idea that the way to eminence is one of great self-denial, for which there are hourly temptations to diverge, in which a man can be kept in his boyhood only by a schoolmaster's severity or a parent's incessant watchfulness and in afterlife by the attractions of fortunate friendships and other favourable circumstances. This is true enough of the great majority of men, but it is simply not true of the generality of those who have gained great reputations. Such men, biographies show to be haunted and driven by an incessant instinctive craving for intellectual work, if forcibly withdrawn from the path that leads towards eminence, they will find their way back to it, as surely as a lover to his mistress. They do not work for the sake of eminence, but to satisfy natural craving for brain work, just as athletes cannot endure repose on account of their muscular irritability, which insists upon exercise. It is very unlikely that any conjunction of circumstances should supply a stimulus to brain work, commensurate with what these men carry in their own constitutions. The action of external stimuli must be uncertain and intermitted, owing to their very nature the disposition abides. It keeps a man ever employed now wrestling with his difficulties, now brooding over his immature ideas, and renders him a quick and eager listener to innumerable, almost inaudible teachings that others are keenly on the watch and are sure to miss. These considerations lead to my third argument. I have shown that social hindrances cannot impede men of high ability from becoming eminent. I shall now maintain that social advantages are incompetent to give that status to a man of moderate ability. It would be easy to point out several men of fair capacity who have been pushed forward by all kinds of help, who are ambitious and exert themselves to the utmost, but who completely fail in attaining eminence. If great peers, they may be lord lieutenants of countries. If they belong to great county families, they may become influential members of parliament and local notabilities. When they die, they leave a blank for a while in a large circle, but there is no Westminster Abbey and no public mourning for them perhaps barely a biographical notice in the columns of the daily papers. It is difficult to specify two large classes of men with equal social advantages, in one of which they have high hereditary gifts, while in the other they have not. I must not compare the sons of eminent men with those of non-eminent, because much which I ascribe to breed others might ascribe to parental encouragement and example. Therefore, I will compare the sons of eminent men with the adopted sons of popes and other dignitaries of the Roman Catholic Church. The practice of nepotism among ecclesiastics is universal. It consists in their giving those social helps to a nephew or other more distant relative that ordinary people give to their children. Now, I shall show abundantly in the course of this book that the nephew of an eminent man has far less chance of becoming eminent than a son and that a more remote kinsman has far less chance than a nephew. We may therefore make a very fair comparison for the purposes of my argument between the success of the sons of eminent men and that of the nephews or more distant relatives who stand in the place of sons to the high unmarried in ecclesiastics of the Romish church. If social help is really of the highest importance, the nephews of the popes will attain eminence as frequently or nearly so as the sons of other eminent men, otherwise they will not. Are then the nephews, etc., of the popes, on the whole, as highly distinguished as are the sons of other equally eminent men? I answer decidedly not. 
There have been a few popes who would of illustrious races, such as that of the Medici, but in the enormous majority of cases the pope is the ablest member of his family. I do not profess to have worked up the kinships of the Italians with any special care, but I have seen amply enough of them to justify me in saying that the individuals whose advancement has been due to nepotism are curiously undistinguished. The very common combination of the able son and an eminent parent is not matched, in the case of high Romish ecclesiastics, by an eminent nephew and an eminent uncle. The social helps are the same, but hereditary gifts are wanting in the latter case. To recapitulate... I have endeavoured to show in respect to literary and artistic eminence. 1. That men who are gifted with high abilities, even men of class upper E, easily rise through all the obstacles caused by inferiority of social rank. 2. Countries where there are fewer hindrances than in England, to a poor man rising in life, produce a much larger proportion of persons of culture, but not of what I call eminent men. 3. Men who are largely aided by social advantages are unable to achieve eminence unless they are endowed with high natural gifts. It may be well to add a few supplementary remarks on the small effects of a good education on a mind of the highest order. A youth of abilities G and X is almost independent of ordinary school education. He learns from passing hints with a quickness and thoroughness that others cannot comprehend. He is omnivorous of intellectual work devouring in a vast deal more than he can utilize but extracting a small percentage of nutriment that makes in the aggregate an enormous supply the best care that a master can take of such a boy is to leave him alone just directing a little here and there and checking desultory tendencies it is a mere accident if a man is placed in his youth in the profession for which he has the most special vocation it will consequently be remarked in my short biographical notices that the most illustrious men have frequently broken loose from the life prescribed by their parents and followed careless of cost the paramount dictation of their own natures in short they educate themselves d'alembert is a striking instance of this kind of self-reliance he was a foundling afterwards shown to be well bred as respects ability and put out to nurse as a pauper baby to the wife of a poor glazier the child's indomitable tendency to the highest studies could not be repressed by his foster mother's ridicule and dissuasion nor by the taunts of his schoolfellows nor by the discouragements of his schoolmaster who was incapable of appreciating him nor even by the reiterated deep disappointment of finding that his ideas which he knew to be original were not novel but long previously discovered by others of course we should expect a boy of this kind to undergo ten or more years of apparently hopeless strife but we should equally expect him to succeed at last and Allenbert did succeed in attaining the first rank of celebrity by the time he was twenty-four the reader has only to turn over the pages of my book to find abundant instances of this emergence from obscurity in spite of the utmost discouragement in early youth a prodigal nature commonly so prolongs the period when a man's perceptive faculties are at his keenest that a faulty education in youth is readily repaired in after life the education of watt the great mathematician was of a merely elementary character during his youth and manhood he was engrossed with mechanical specialities it was not till he became advanced in years that he had leisure to educate himself and yet by the time he was an old man he had become singularly well read and widely and accurately informed the scholar who in the eyes of his contemporaries and immediate successors made one of the greatest reputations as such that any man has ever made was julius caesar Scalinger. his youth was i believe entirely unlettered he was in the army until he was twenty-nine and then he led a vagrant professional life trying everything and sticking to nothing at length he fixed himself upon greek his first publications were at the age of forty-seven and between that time and the period of a somewhat early death he earned his remarkable reputation only exceeded by that of his son boyhood in youth the period between fifteen and twenty-two years of age which afford to the vast majority of men the only period for the acquirement of intellectual facts and habits are just seven years neither more nor less important than other years in the lives of men of the highest order people are too apt to complain of their imperfect education insinuating that they would have done great things if they had been more fortunately circumstanced in youth but if their power of learning is materially diminished by the time they have discovered their want of knowledge it is very profitable that their abilities are not of a very high description and that however well they might have been educated they would have succeeded but little better even if a man be long unconscious of his powers an opportunity is sure to occur they occur over and over again to every man that will discover them even if a man be long unconscious of his powers an opportunity is sure to occur they occur over and over again to every man that will discover them 
he will then soon make up for past arrears and outstrip competitors with very many years start in the race of life there is an obvious analogy between the man of brains and the man of muscle in the unmistakable way in which they may discover and assert their claims to superiority over less gifted but far better educated competitors an average sailor climbs rigging and the average alpine guide scrambles along cliffs with a facility that seems like magic to a man who has been reared away from ships and mountains but if he have extraordinary gifts a very little trial will reveal them and he will rapidly make up for his arrears of education a born gymnast will soon in his turn astonish the sailors by his feats before the voyage was half over he would outrun them like an escaped monkey i have witnessed an instance of this myself every summer it happens that some young english tourist who has never previously planted his foot on a crag or ice succeeds in alpine work to a marvellous degree thus far i have spoken only of literary men and artists who however form the bulk of the two hundred fifty per million that attain to eminence the reasoning that is true for them requires large qualifications when applied to statesmen and commanders unquestionably the most illustrious statesmen and commanders belong to say the least to the classes f and g of ability but it does not at all follow that an english cabinet minister if he be a great territorial lord should belong to those classes or even to the two or three below them social advantages have enormous power in bringing a man into so prominent a position as a statesman that it is impossible to refuse him the title of eminent though it may be more than probable that if he had been changed in his cradle and reared in obscurity he would have lived and died without emerging from humble life again we have seen that a union of three separate qualities intellect zeal and power of work are necessary to raise men from the ranks only two of these qualities in a remarkable degree namely intellect and power of work are required by a man who is pushed into public life because when he is once there the interest is so absorbing and the competition so keen as to supply the necessary stimulus to an ordinary mind therefore many men who have succeeded as statesmen would have been nobodies had they been born in a lower rank of life they would have needed zeal to rise talleyrand would have passed his way as other grand seigneurs if he had not been ejected from his birthright by a family council on account of his deformity and thrown into the vortex of the french revolution the furious excitement of the game overcame his inveterate indolence and he developed into the foremost man of the period after napoleon and mirabeau as for sovereigns they belonged to a peculiar category the qualities most suitable to the ruler of a great nation are not such as lead to eminence in private life devotion to particular studies obstinate perseverance geniality and frankness in social relations are important qualities to make a man rise in the world but they are unsuitable to a sovereign he has to view many interests and opinions with an equal eye to know how to yield his favourite ideas to popular pressure to be reserved in his friendships and be able to stand alone on the other hand a sovereign does not greatly need the intellectual powers that are essential to the rise of a common man because the best brains of the country are at his service consequently i do not busy myself in this volume with the families of merely able sovereigns only with those few whose military and administrative capacity is acknowledged to have been of the very highest order as regards commanders the qualities that rise a man to a peerage may be of a peculiar kind that as would not have raised him to eminence in ordinary times strategy is as much a speciality as chess playing and large practice is required to develop it it is difficult to see how strategic gifts combined with a hardy constitution dashing courage and a restless disposition can achieve eminence in times of peace these qualities are more likely to attract a man to the hunting field if he have enough money or if not to make him an unsuccessful speculator it consequently happens that generals of high but not very high orders such as napoleon's marshals and cromwell's generals are rarely found to have eminent kinsfolk very different is the case with the most illustrious commanders they are far more than strategists and men of restless dispositions they would have distinguished themselves under any circumstances their kinships are most remarkable as will be seen in my chapter on commanders which includes the names of alexander scipio hannibal caesar marlborough cromwell the princes of nassau wellington and napoleon precisely the same remarks are applicable to demagogues those who rise to the surface and play a prominent part in the transactions of a troubled period must have courage and force of character but they need not have high intellectual powers 
nay it is more appropriate that the intellects of such men should be narrow and one-sided and their dispositions moody and embittered these are not qualities that lead to eminence in ordinary times consequently the families of such men are mostly unknown to fame but kinships of popular leaders of the highest order as of the two gracchi of the two artevelds and of mirabeau are illustrious i may mention a class of cases that strikes me forcibly as proof that a sufficient power of command to lead to eminence in troubled times is much less unusual than is commonly supposed and that it lies neglected in the very life in beleaguered towns as for example during the great indian mutiny a certain type of character very frequently made its appearance people rose into notice who had never previously distinguished themselves and subsided into their former way of life after the occasion for exertion was over or during the continuance of danger and misery they were the heroes of the situation they were cool in danger sensible in conflict cheerful under prolonged suffering humane to the wounded and sick encouragers of the faint-hearted such people were formed to shine only under exceptional circumstances they had the advantage of possessing too tough a fibre to be crushed by anxiety and physical misery and perhaps in consequence of that very toughness they required a stimulus of the sharpest kind to goad them toward the exertions of which they were capable the result of what i have said is to show that in statesmen and commanders mere eminence is by no means a satisfactory criterion of such natural gifts as would make a man distinguished under whatever circumstances he had been reared on the other hand statesmen of a higher order and the commanders of the very highest who overthrow all opponents must be prodigiously gifted the reader must judge the cases i quote in proof of hereditary gifts by their several merits i have endeavoured to speak of none but the most illustrious names it would have led to false conclusions had i taken a larger number and thus descended to a lower level of merit in conclusion i see no reason to be dissatisfied with the conditions under which i am bound of accepting high reputation as a very fair test of high ability the nature of the test would not have been altered if i had attempted to readjust each man's reputation according to his merits because this is what every biographer does if i had possessed the critical power of a saint beuve i should have merely thrown into literature another of those numerous expressions of opinion by the aggregate of which all reputations are built to conclude i feel convinced that no man can achieve a very high reputation without being gifted with very high abilities and i trust i have shown reason to believe that few who possess these very high abilities can fail in achieving eminence End of chapter four.